our staff. Thank you. Can I close this? No. So it's wonderful to see all of you here. Um, when I started uh, studying Islam uh, a few decades ago um, and d decided to go into get a PhD in Islamic studies, there were maybe a handful of graduate programs that taught about Islam. And uh, there were only like three to five jobs per year if you were lucky in, in Islamic studies. Um, all of that has changed um, since 9-11. Uh, since so for a person who teaches and studies Islam, this is wonderful in some ways to see. It's got its downfalls too, but it's also wonderful to see all of, all of you here. It's particularly nice to see um, members of the Muslim community um, among us and to be able to use this opportunity and be, I'm grateful for, uh, to our library to be able to, to create a space where um, the Muslims within our community and non-Muslims could come together um, to have a civil and, and uh, academically informed, scholarly informed discussion about Islam. Having said that, I'm going to step out of role, whatever it is stage actors say, and then they <laughs> step out of role. Um, to say that um, having been asked to be a part of this project as a person who just, you know, this past summer spent three months writing an article about conceptions of justice in Sheikh Mufid's uh, understanding of rationalism in, and in his introduction of rationalism into Shi'i thought, a chapter that's going to be part of a volume that I'm lucky if the other people who are contributing to the volume read. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's rare to be able to actually have an opportunity to talk to a, to a larger audience. More people are probably going to read this essay that I've written than anything else I'll ever read in my, write in my entire life. So it's hard for me to ask me to stand up here and play a role as though I haven't been involved in choosing these things and, and, um, and writing this essay. So I'm going to speak, try to speak in multiple registers because I also realize who's paying for my room tonight. Um, <laughs> So, um, and I'm going to trust that you could see that I'm speaking on multiple registers, and I'm not going to try to play the role of you as scholars in your own, in your own communities, but I'm going to try to speak as though I was talking within, the, uh, within um, my own sort of Portland community and speaking to you as scholars and directors of this program who are, uh, who are going to be using this project. So I want to begin actually by contextualizing the American stories theme in the larger context of the bookshelf on Muslim journeys. And I was really glad that Giancarlo yesterday in his keynote speech also talked about the importance of this term journeys, and I want to give you my take on it a bit. So Muslim journeys is a particularly apt title for understanding the presence of Muslims in the United States. And it's not for the reason that you think. It's not because Muslims journeyed here. Um, that's, not, that's not the reason that I have in mind. It's apt because it's a, the word journeys captures both the plurality and the dynamism of Islam in America. Any project that tries to represent Islam or Muslims is immediately confronted, as we were when we first began to think about, and I was one of the few scholars who, who's, um, who was involved in this project from January of 2011, um, when we were confronted with this idea of how do we deal with this diversity of practices and peoples and histories associated with Islam. Uh, phrases one often hears to represent Muslims collectively, phrases like, um, the Muslim world, or Islamic cultures, or Islamic culture, leave one uh, with the mistaken impression that Islam somehow homogenizes um, the enormous diversity that exists between practitioners of Islam, and this may be not news to most of you here, but you know, the enormous diversity that exists between people in the Caucasus and West Africa, you know, between Indonesia and Saudi Arabia, and between France and South Africa. And even I have to say, as a scholar of Islam, I find myself often being surprised by this diversity. I've been sometimes asked to talk about, you know, what's distinctive about Islam in America? And I say something, and there's someone in the audience who says, like, well, I'm from Malaysia, and we do the, the same, you know, we, we have the same thing. Uh, you know, there was a big uh, brouhaha about a woman-led prayer in, uh, in uh, New York a, while, a few years ago. Well, people had done that actually in South Africa before. So uh, I continue even myself to be surprised by um, the diversity, even though I'm a specialist in Islamic studies. Um, the use of the plural here, this little s in the title of the, uh, this bookshelf is important because it keeps diversity of Islam at the forefront of our inquiry. The use of the word journey rather than world or culture 
also reminds us that Islam, as all religions, is dynamic. It is shaped by the varying context where it is practiced, just as its practice shapes those contexts. That is, Islam, and this is something those of us who study religion often say, is like any religion or ideology, both shapes and is shaped by the varying context where it is practiced. And this is what I mean by it being dynamic. As such, it is dynamic, and the word journey captures this dynamism in a way that wor uh, words like world or culture, even in their plural forms, don't. And I'm particularly proud that the NEH and the ALA kept to, that, to, this, uh, to this title. It's, you know, it's um, I don't know, groundbreaking, earth-shattering, <laughs> uh, to have a national program that actually recognizes Islam as being both dynamic and, and uh, diverse. The diverse practice of Islam do not occur in isolation from one another, however. They come into contact with one another through books, television, and such rites as the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca, which contributes to its dynamism. And these diverse expressions of Islam are also in contact with one another in places like the United States, where Muslims from every corner of the globe are present and in contact with, uh, with one another in mosques and community centers throughout the country. Even in a place like, name your own cities, you know, Portland, uh, where I live, uh, and where we're known more for being funky and our food carts than for our diversity. Uh, I think we're the second whitest major city in the United States. Um, <laughs> there are tens, tens of different languages spoken at any of our major mosques at any point in time. I'm not kidding about this. So any attempt to understand American Muslim stories has to contend with both the diversity and dynamism of how Islam um, is practiced in the United States. The books on the bookshelf under the American Stories theme collectively aim to introduce readers to this diversity and dynamism by providing models of how the humanities could help us make sense of them. I'll say something about each of the books shor uh, uh, shortly, but let me first say something about the essay uh, that accompanies them. So the essay places these within um, a chronological order of the history of Islam in America. And if we had, if we were reading the books in that order, and when starting with the A Quiet Revolution, you could go through that, through the books in that order, and walk yourself through uh, chronologically through American history, and look at Muslim experiences of major eras in in American history, and see how it, what sort of new questions, new experiences they bring they bring to light. Um, and, even, uh, and we could see then that even though most Americans become aware of the presence of Muslims in the United States after 9-11, uh, Muslims have been present in this country since colonial times. Often when I speak about American Muslim histories, people, both Muslims and non-Muslims, question how significant this history actually was. And it was quite significant. There was one time where I gave a um, talk um, for Mercy Corps, and a Muslim leader in the Portland community got up and said, like, this is all fine and dandy that you're talking about these things, but isn't it that really the presence of Muslim in Muslim history in the United States began in the 1960s, where all these people immigrated to this country, and when African American Muslims became Sunni Muslims. You know, isn't it really then that it began? And no, it's not. Um, you know, I reminded them that organizations like the Muslim Student Association, the Islamic Society of North America, actually structured themselves on the models of the Federation of Islamic Associations that was founded much earlier by people who were veterans of World War II and born in America. Uh, who decided to not have a centralized Islamic center, but rather actually have it be a federation that allowed local commun Muslim communities a great deal of autonomy. When new immigrants came, those institutions and structures and communities and mosques existed, and they didn't completely change them, even though they want everyone to believe that that's what they did. They worked within those systems and they changed them. So there's actually an institutional history of Muslims in America that shapes a distinctive American Muslim uh, uh, experience and uh, American Muslim institutions. And if we go through the books chronologically, you get to get a sense of that. While the overview essay that accompanies the books under the American story theme places them in this chronological order, we don't need to read the books in those ways, uh, in that way, and each of the books is also intended to be able to stand uh, completely on its own. Um, so let me now say something about each of the books real quick. Prince Among Slaves, uh, and if you have the, the essay with you, we could, we could see the books I'm talking about. Um, this is one of those oldies but goodies. Um, it was one of the earliest historical studies of Muslims done in the United States. There are uh, earlier studies of actually Muslims done in the United States by Muslims and were published in Egypt in, in, in Arabic. 
It narrates the story of Abdurrahman Ibrahim, a Muslim warrior who was the son of an important Muslim leader in Futa Jalon in West Africa. Abdurrahman was captured while leading a raid on behalf of his father and was sold into slavery. Uh, through, this incredible, uh, through his incredible life story, Terry Alford highlights the connections between West Africa, Western Europe, and the Americas that made up the Atlantic world. Um, given the Eurocentricism that John Carlo talked about a bit in his, um, in his keynote, in much of the histories of the modern world, we often overlook the fact that West Europeans sailed south around Africa and, uh, and west through the Atlantic in order to discover new routes, trade routes, to East Asia and South Asia that would bypass land routes that travel through Muslim empires. And they colonized these regions with the help of slave labor purchased from regions of a Africa that had large Muslim populations. Muslims were thus very much involved in the imperial rivalries and global markets that helped establish the Americas. Abdurrahman's life story reminds us of this often forgotten aspect of the quote unquote discovery and colonization of the new world. The extraordinary events surrounding Abdurrahman's life in America, which led to his emancipation at the behest of his uh, Secretary of State Henry Clay, and took him to the White House and introduced him to the elite of his time, also give us a sense of how race, religion, literacy, and conceptions of a civilized society were configured in antebellum America. We may be surprised to find out, actually, it was because of African Muslims that people in the antebellum America began to realize that, oh, blacks could read and write. Africans could actually re be educated. Um, when they found out that there were Muslims who could actually read and write Arabic and actually belong to elites in society and were educated, and there was this huge movement um, to actually translate the Bible into Arabic, um, and, and also uh, um, great push was given to the abolitionist movement to be able to say, you know, we're really talking about, it may seem anachronistic to say, the human beings here in Africa that are just as capable as every, everybody else. Um, the Columbia, the next book on the list, the Columbia Source Book of Muslims in the United States, is perhaps the most difficult of the books that we're going to look at, um, and it's most difficult perhaps to read in a reading group because it's a source book of primary sources. Um, it's important, however, that we, we do examine this because it's, it, gives, it collects some of the pre-1965 histories of Muslims um, in America, uh, which is really hard to get at as things stand today. In the overview essay, um, uh, I mentioned, or the overview essay mentions various sections of it that could be read along with other books that, that we're reading in the American Stories theme. But there's also a number of, a number of selections there that are highlighted um, that get, at the, get us at a sense of American and Muslim history um, uh, from the Civil War to the 1960s and 1970s when we had a large um, number of Muslims immigrating to the United States and where many African-American Muslims converted to Sunni Islam. Um, this selection provides us a glimpse into the lives of early immigrants from the Levant in South Asia and the first Muslim missionaries in the United States. It also introduces readers to the turn to Islam among some African Americans at the beginning of the 20th century. So we often say you know, that the Muslim population in the United States is the most diverse anywhere in the globe. Um, to the point that we have indigenous you know, Muslim movements that completely started in the United States that don't exist in other parts of, uh, parts of the world, uh, groups like the Moorish Science Temple and, and the Nation of Islam. Um, it, it begins to give you a sense of where those groups emerged and allows them to speak on their own, uh, on their own behalf. And they're wonderful to see the way in which, right at the beginning of the 20th century, when Europe is sort of falling apart and there's all these great optimism about what it means to be American and, uh, and modernity, where African Americans use Islam as a way of writing themselves into that, narr into that narrative of, uh, of America, but as blacks. But because of racism, they couldn't say we're American, black Americans, but they use Islam as a way of developing a national identity um, that they could be proud of, that it would allow people to participate in the, in the larger modernity of America at that time. The third book on the list, uh, Acts of Faith, is a memoir of one of the most prominent Muslim interfaith activists in the United States, whose parents were among the large number of immigrants who came to the United States after the liberalization of immigration laws in 1965. 
Um, this is when the Immigration Act of 1965 got rid of quotas that severely limited immigration from anywhere outside of the Northwest, outside, outside of Northwest Europe. And the idea behind this was people were hoping that so Southern Europeans would start coming, uh, with their families to the to the United States to rejoin families who had come earlier. But for the most part, most of the immigrants that came came from Asia and Africa and Latin America. Uh, Patel's story is also interesting because. He's an Ismaili Shi'i of Indian descent. So we talked about Ismaili Shi'is, we talked about groups like the Nation of Islam, but two words that begin with D come to mind? Diversity. <laughs> dynamism. I'm just checking to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> Diverse, say with me, diversity, <laughs> dynamism. Um, he comes of age in the 1980s at the height of debates over identity politics and multiculturalism in the United States. Um, Many of us may remember how important those types of things were. You know, everything we read, we read, uh, you know, is this from, a, you know, what perspective is this from? Is this from a woman's perspective? Is it a white person's perspective? What type of class is being represented here? All those debates that uh, were all the rage in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and more importantly, when we begin to think about this in terms of Islam, um, <clears throat> this is when we, we remember that our society had changed because of these new immigration laws, right? And because of the civil rights legislation that gave new immigrants different ri rights from earlier immigrants. Um, and he, Patel walks us through that moment as a Muslim in American history. And he tries to make sense of, um, the, um, he tries to make sense of it for us and make sense of us for a time at a time where America itself was trying to make a sense of its multicultural ident uh, identity and is, as a, make sense of itself as a multicultural society. He, rep he represents the first generation of Americans for whom racial, ethnic, and religious diversity was broadly understood, and for whom this, di this diversity was a fact of daily life. People like me, who went to uh, high school in Los Angeles, we had four white kids in our, in our high school of, uh, of 300 students. Um, some of you may know about Will Herberg's famous sociological study of religious life in post-World War II America. In this book, he declared America essentially a Protestant, Catholic, Jewish nation. But Patel grew up with Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, as well as Presbyterians, Lutherans, Reformed Jews, Catholics, and so on. Um, so looking at his memoir, again, we get a, good, we get a, a Muslim view of an important, part of, uh, an important aspect of uh, America's rec most, more recent history. His self-understanding as an American of Muslim and Indian heritage was shaped in the midst, midst of struggles for inclusion, social justice, and equality. And he eloquently narrates the process by which he brought his faith, activism, ethnicity, and national identity seamlessly together into what can only be called the quintessentially American Muslim identity. And then he went on to form an organization through which he's now helping other uh, young Americans do the same. And not just Americans, because it's actually international, but um, to, you know, this uh, interfaith youth core and that tries to get others to be able to make sense of them, their own multi multiplicity of their identities in the context of um, contemporary American society or wherever they're coming from. Um, the fourth book on the list is The Quiet Revolutions, but since we're talking about that, I'm gonna skip that for now and jump to the Butterfly Mosque. This is another memoir penned by a young graphic novelist, Willow Wilson who, like almost all the students who sit in my undergraduate classes, grew up at a time when her nation was at war in Muslim-majority countries and had declared a seemingly, seemingly unending battle against terror to be Islamic terrorism. She came from a white middle-class background. Uh, <laughs> just checking. <laughs> and converted to Islam and this is interesting, converted to Islam based on what she had learned primarily from books. Right? So she, had, she actually you know, decides to convert to Islam on a plane by herself, um, which is not really according to Islamic law, converting to Islam because there are no witnesses to the conversion. Uh, she, does that, she does that later, but she, had, she you know, thinks about what it meant to be a Muslim, understands what it meant to be a Muslim from reading, reading books, listening to lectures, and hanging out with Muslim friends. She moved to Cairo and met an Egyptian man whom she later married. In the Butterfly Mosque, she tries to communicate in the era of war on terror how she understands Islam. 
and what she has learned about Middle Eastern Muslims from living in, in Egypt. And people, some of the people in reviewing her book have faulted her for not talking enough about how she met this man and giving us the juicy details of that relationship. But that's not what she's really concerned about. She's really concerned about her, speaking out of her experiences to an American audience about what, how she understands Islam. Her work is remarkable for the way in which she demonstrates the difficulties involved in understanding other cultures by relating her experiences. She argues that recognition of the humanity of others requires not only sympathy and compassion, but also hard work and dedication, particularly at the, in the, our age, which is sort of an age of clash of civilizations. Let me now turn to um, a quiet revolution. So um, as you heard, uh, you, you know, we've been hearing this past couple of days, um, Muslim Journeys is part of a larger public program spearheaded by the NEH titled Bridging Cultures. And I'm assuming that you have all read the book and the overview is this, so I don't wanna spend a lot of time summarizing the book. I just want to focus my comments on how Leila Ahmed models a way the humanities could foster intercultural understanding broadly and improve the nature of our public discourse on Islam specifically, which to be honest, uh, could use all the help it could get. Um, given particularly a, that we live at a time where American national identity as a superpower abroad and as a multicultural society at home is being defined in relationship to Muslims, right? The amount of ignorance that exists about Islam, the amount of uh, misinformation that exists about Islam in our popular discourse in light of its political and national importance is just mind boggling. As a scholar who has done his fair share of public speaking on Islam, I found that no matter what my audience's feelings are about Islam as a religion, whether they're Islamophobes or Islamophiles, they believe they either know what Islam is all about based on the exposure they have gotten from the media or that it's too complicated that they can't ever understand it. Right? Um, it's again mind boggling that someone will convert to a religion from simply what they read in books, right? Um, this is one of those cases where a little bit of knowledge is is uh, a dangerous thing. Um, as people who study religion, you know, I often tell my students this, we're kind of used to this, right? So you could, you, you could, if you're a medical doctor and then you're a cocktail party and you tell people you're a medical doctor, someone's about to come up to you and say like, I got this problem in my abdomen or my back or you know, <laughs> can you help me? If you go to someone and you're like, what do you do? I, I teach religion, they're like, that's wonderful. So I'm sure you're teaching your students that Islam is X, Y, and Z. And then I'm sure you're teaching your students that religion is this or religion is that. No one, no one recognizes your expertise, right? Um, and that's one of the wonderful things about studying religion, actually. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, it's humbling, right? It always reminds us that we're completely dependent on what other people say religion is. Um, and, and with Islam, it's, all, it's a little bit more frustrating though because, and I see it less as an opportunity, uh, as a teaching opportunity because of how important, again, it is that we understand Islam properly, right? Imagine, uh, Leila Ahmed talks about this very briefly, but imagine how many different terms we've been using in the past two decades to talk about like Islamic fundamentalism, militant Muslims, Islamism, uh, you know, and jihadism, and no one exactly knows what they're talking about most of the time when they're using in these terms. Um, just a couple of other quick anecdotes. Um, you know, once after being interviewed in a newspaper, I got an email from someone who was very upset about what I had to say and, wrote, and wanted to give me his credentials and he listed all the books he owns on Islam. And he didn't even say I've read them. Yeah. <laughs> he, said, he said, and you know, I know what the Sharia is because I own the Shafi's Risala. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, on the other hand, I've been at very sort of high level meetings, international me uh, uh, meetings uh, where people who work in uh, foreign affairs um, are asked about Islam and they come and say, well, Islam is just too diverse and too complicated, so we can't really factor it in, you know, because we don't really know what's going on. Uh, whatever we say, someone else says the opposite thing, we're not sure what's going, uh, what's going on. And the NEH maybe could correct me in the, in, w uh, about this too. Even at the NEH, there, as we were thinking about this project, there was a sense of like, well, this person, this scholar is saying that, we gotta check it against this other scholar, see like who's actually, because there's so many different voices that are, that are being said. And I'm sure in our, your own libraries, 
you will find, and as you have discussions around these, you'll find similar types of things, people saying different things. And some of it is because they, they're uh, using different methodologies to interpret Islam. Some of it is because they have different exposures to different aspects of the Muslim popu mo um, global Muslim population. So their, their database is, is different. Now, societies that practice Islam are varied enough that you could make whatever statement about Islam you like, and I could point to some group somewhere in the world for whom that statement fits. So you could say Muslims are misogynist, and I could point to some group for whom uh, they are misogynist. And I could point to others who have had Muslim heads of state, and some of them in places like we had an Iranian vice president who was a woman. Um, that may surprise some people. Um, you could say Muslims are backward or from the Middle Ages, and I could point to places where, yes, you know, there's no running water, and, uh, and people are living as they would have a 1,000 years ago, and I could also point to places where they're hyper-modern and uh, ushering a new, new post-postmodern Twitter revolutions, right? Um, so it's diverse enough that one could point to anything to substantiate whatever claims are heard. The question then becomes for us, how do you open up a space for public discussion around Islam when people either think they know all they need to know about Islam or that Islam is too complicated and diverse it's virtually impossible to discuss it or understand it? Now, I'd argue that American Muslim stories are one of those rare places today where we could begin to have public discussions about Islam sensibly. The reason for this is because the American context of Muslims uh, in America is familiar, but American Muslim stories and experiences are distinctive enough and even surprising enough to create the kind of dissonance we need in our public discourse to have more nuanced and, and informed discussions about Islam. American Muslim stories also bridge Muslim histories with American history. As I hope you noted in A Quiet Revolution, one can't really understand the resurgence of the veil in the United States without understanding the history of Islamist movements abroad. Or conversely, one can't really understand the history of veiling in Islamist movements without understanding the role American and European governments, sort of enlightenment ideas and technologies, modern technologies, have played in Muslim-majority societies since the uh, late 19th century. In A Quiet Revolution, Ahmed uses the practice of veiling in America as a window onto modern history of Islamic movements and as a pathway to move in, uh, to a more informed and nuanced public discussion of Islam. She takes the veil, which came to symbolize she takes a veil, which came to symbolize Islam over the past century, and asks, how did this article of women's clothing come to play such a central role in the process by which Muslims and non-Muslims, nation states and Islamist associations, negotiated the public role of Islam in the modern era? And <clears throat> this may not be as important for audiences in a public library, but I think as scholars and as educators, um, What's much more important than finding the right information is learning to ask the right questions. And I think she begins to ask this right question. You know, where did, how did this symbol get the power that it has? And not whether or not the veil is a good or bad thing, whether Islamic or not Islamic. Um, and I want to say, incidentally, another point, and she's a feminist, um, is that there were similar discussions about most, uh, men's clothing. And for men's clothing, this was a little bit more charged because if men wore hats when they prayed, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't actually put their forehead to the ground. So in places like Iran, actually, in the 1930s, there were demonstrations against the changes that the government was imposing in men's clothing long before there were debates about uh, women's clothing. Um, and one of the issues was people thought that this was a way of um, divorcing Muslims from their religion, that they were going to wear an attire that wouldn't allow them to pray properly. Um, and it was, a, it was a really major issue to the point that there were parliaments. Um, it was uh, uh, passed laws to say, like, what kind of hats we could wear and not wear. And she doesn't act, but none of that actually becomes as important as the veil, right? And she, her book sort of gives us a... Uh, helps us explain why it is that women's bodies and women's clothing becomes particularly important as opposed to men's and why it is that women continue to be marked in very specific ways in the histories of modern Islam. She doesn't ask the question policymakers, social scientists, and Islamists often ask. I'm, uh, I'm saying Islamists, not Islamicists, right? Not scholars of Islam, but people who use Islam as an ideology. Is the, she, so she doesn't ask, is the veil a good thing or a bad thing for modern women and modern societies? Nor does she ask the religious question of whether or not the veil is Islamic. 
Rather, she asked the more humanistic question of how did an article of clothing come to carry the burden of defining a global religion's place in relation to modern ideas of progress and equal rights? As a feminist, she also asked, did it come to represent Mus um, how did it come to represent Muslim women in the public square to such a degree as to muffle, if not silence, the actual voices of Muslim women? How did the veil become a metonym for Muslim women and their public roles and private, uh, private desires? Stylistically, Ahmed broaches this question by placing the veil in the familiar context of an urban park in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She tells us honestly how she herself understood the veil and how she was taken back to see women adopted in the United States where they didn't actually have to veil and where actually by veiling they brought negative attention to themselves, right? So she opens up in these ways to, to connect with the questions that people often have that, but aren't, are afraid to actually ask out loud because they're worried about whether they would seem to be a liberal or anti-Muslim or so on. She then spends the rest of the book carefully historicizing the veil. She shows us how varietly it has been understood and interpreted in modern times. She shows its varied relation to empire, Islamism, piety, and feminism. By demonstrating the multiple meanings and roles the veil has had over time, she neutralizes the strong emotions the veil sparks in our public discourse and allows us to understand its evolving role in the modern times as a symbol. And this is what I meant by her, her book sort of serving as a model about the types of public discussions we could have. She shows us how the veil as a symbol has come to objectify Islam. Right? Let me say that again. She shows us how the veil has come to objectify Islam, reducing a rich and diverse tradition to an article of clothing. The surprising conclusion she arrives at at the end of her study also shows us how the symbol of the veil by objectifying Islam, and this isn't just objectifying Islam for non-Muslims, but also for Muslims, right? She shows us that, uh, uh, how Islamists use this to be able to mark themselves as distinct, to be able to reduce Islam to a set of ideologies, to a set of practices, to a, set, to a sort of way of life that you could measure and point to. Um, uh, so the, the surprising conclusion she arrives at at the end of her study also shows us how the symbol of the veil by objectifying Islam has prevented us from understanding the public role of Islam in America so as to miss the central role Islamism has played in adopting, uh, adapting Muslim act activism to America to the point that today it is Islamists and Americans who come from Islamist backgrounds who are at the forefront of the struggle for women's rights and social justice. There's another way of putting this, that American ideas of social justice are very similar to what Islamists' ideas of social justice were. After 9-11, like many scholars of Islam, as I was going through churches and trying to give talks to the general public, I would often begin by summarizing without naming Sayyid Qutb's understanding of Islam. And I would say, this is how I understood religion. And invariably, people in my audience, 60-year-old woman in my audience would say, that's, that's exactly how I understand my religion, that your commitment is only to God, that you know, uh, uh, governments and societies could stray you from that sort of commitment, that your commitment is one of being about justice to society, being about a particular religious life that's going to improve our society that may or may not be in line with what the government wants because we remember that our government wanted us not to drink from the same fountains as blacks, uh, you know, or if we were black, not to drink from the same fountains as whites just a few decades ago, right? So they, um, uh, she points to this... Um, to the similarity that existed in understanding the public role religion could play both in America, which is, again, very different from uh, the role people in Europe see uh, religion playing. And it's something that I myself experienced after 9-11, after I would go talking to churches about how it is that these Islamists understood their religion. And it was only when you got to the point of saying, well, they may advocated violence, when people would say, well, now I'm not sure. Um, but the violence, of course, had to do with um, the specific circumstances there, too. Um, let me move on for the sake of time. So for anyone interested in bridging cultures, it's also worthwhile to note how Leila Ahmed comes to her conclusions um, and the methodology that she uses. I already mentioned that she, do, uh, she does this in, a, in part by historicizing the symbol of the veil and asking how it has come to play its role in the public discourse. She also makes a concerted effort to uncover the voices and lives of the woman who veiled or resisted veiling. She doesn't allow the symbol or state policies to stand for women's stories. And she does this by not assuming, not assuming that the people she is studying are like her, 
whenever uh, we try to understand other cultures, we have to decide the degree to which we focus on our similarities and differences. And most well-meaning people among us uh, try to focus on s similarities, right? We often say, like, aren't we all essentially the same? Don't all religions essentially say the same thing? Well, the truth of the matter is that we're not all the same. And if you say we're the same, the fact that I was born in Iran and you weren't, or the fact that my color of skin is different from yours, gets washed away, and my color of skin is part of who I am, right? And it's part of who you are. And to ignore those differences is, is essentially, in part, not to listen to us, right? Not to, he not to hear us. Um, when we say things like, you know, we're all essentially the same, let's look at how we actually approach things all the same way or understand things the same way. So Ahmed doesn't shy away from telling us her feelings about the veil. Um, had she assumed that all hijabis are like her, it seems unlikely that she would have arrived at her conclusions or that adopted the methodology she does. Rather, it seems unlikely that she would have assumed that hijabis are being oppressed, because that is how she um, and people of her generation in Egypt and class understood the veil. The question she would have asked then would have been, how are they being doped into the, you know, wearing the veil? Who's forcing them to wear the veil? You know, what are their fathers doing? What are their brothers doing? <coughs> Uh, what role should the state play in freeing them from this oppressive practice? You know, and these are, of course, all the questions that states like France have been asking, right? Um, without actually going to Muslim women and, and finding out why it is that they fail. So by not assuming that others share her attitudes toward freedom, women's rights, spirituality, and veiling, she finds it necessary to listen to why Muslim women veil or unveil and to ask what role the veil has played in their lives even if she herself does not agree with them, right? Um, and we have to understand this too. Just because we understand other people doesn't mean we have to agree with them, right? Trying to understand others doesn't mean coming to the same place as they are, right? You could understand why they believe the things they do or have the practices that they do, um, but see them as wrong solutions to similar problems, right? It's much better, I think, um, we could have much more fruitful discussions and hear each other better if you focus on the problems, because common problems we face rather than assuming that we're all the same or that uh, we're ad gonna address this, uh, the problems in the same way. By not assuming that others share her attitudes toward freedom, women's rights, spirituality, and veiling, she finds it necessary to listen to why women veil or unveil and to ask what role does the, uh, the veil has played in their lives. It is only by actually listening to the voices of women in Islamist movements that promoted the veil that she discovers that rather than silencing wom uh, women, the veil and Islamist movements that promoted, uh, that promoted it have helped Muslim women become more active in Islamic organizations and advance new interpretations of the Quran. And this is something that people uh, uh, don't pay attention to when they look at her conclusion. One of the things she also argues is that veiled women are coming up with new hermeneutics of understanding the Quran, new methodologies, new ways of interpreting um, the Quran. As I mentioned in the overview essay, however, the question still remains of whether or not her interpretation of Islamist movements is unduly optimistic. Did she hear from Islamists what she wanted to hear? I hope, and you know, given what's going on in Egypt today, that's something that we should think about. I hope you discuss this point during our discussion period. But before I turn you to the discussion, I want to just say a couple of things about the book that, um, um, that uh, may help you in the discussion. One is her use of the word Islamism. She's very careful on page nine, and I'll let you look that up, to define what she means by Islamism. And her definition of Islamism is very broad. Um, right? She's not talking about just militant Muslims. She's talking about a very specific definition of Islamism that she consistently uses throughout the book and is not the definition that everybody uses when they talk about Islamism. So let's keep, uh, keep that in mind. And um, if you don't remember the definition, might be a, it might be a good place to begin to see how she's using the word Islamism um, or, and whether or not she needs to be faulted for having such a broad definition of Islamism. Um, the another thing is that the way in which she uses sources so you see, she, she picks a couple of sources, right? And she tells the story of decades through those sources, and it may seem like she hasn't read anything else. But that's not the case, right? In trying to write an accessible book, she's gone through, read everything, and her selection of sources are very careful, right? They're, 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 um, they're sort of what she's found to be the best ways of thinking about uh, the era that she's talking about or the problem that she's talking about, and she uses them as interlocutors to, to, make, her, uh, to make her argument. Um, 
and no, you know, knowing Leila Ahmed, uh, she's not a person who speaks lightly or uh, you know utters a sentence without thinking about it and you know having it go over her head ten times, uh, you know whether or not this is exactly what she wants to say. Um, so. Again, and in public discussions of the book, it's important to know that there's a lot of literature on this stuff, and she sort of handpicked what she thinks are the most useful um, uh, and the best sort of examples of what she wants to talk about. Um, there's another thing that she doesn't do, which is talk about whether or not the hijab is a cultural practice or a religious practice, which I expect most Americans want to know. You know, is this really required of Islam? <laughs> Does, you know, what does the Quran say? And if we ask that question, we're asking the wrong question, right? Um, when asking you know, my wife, um, you know, if you were going to sit in an audience and hear a book about the veil, what would you want to hear about? Her response was immediately, I would want to know whether it's cultural, whether it's religious, you know, what, what, what a woman's supposed to really do according to Islam. And, and to ask that question is to ask the wrong question, right? To not see the dynamism of Islam. That to not see that Islamic practices, Islamic, um, beliefs have been shaped in relationship to contexts. And Muslim have answered that question differently. And the way in which someone today would answer that question would be different in, you know, this room would be different from the way in which someone 20 years ago would have answered it in Egypt, and someone 50 years ago would have answered it in Alexandria, or someone, you know, today would answer it in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, name your place, Chechnya, <laughs> right? Um, so I hope, I hope that we steer away from uh, continuously asking uh, that question. That question may be an important religious question for somebody to know, right, whether or not they need to, whether God requires this uh, of them. Uh, but to come out and say Islam says pr a particular thing about veiling when it says diverse things about veiling would be to not, to miss the point. Okay, so let me stop there. I think I've gone overboard. Um, and turn you to your discussion groups.